everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Women Behind Anime and Manga podcast. My name is Valerie, and I am so pumped to get us started on episode two, where it all began. Uh, in my last podcast episode, I introduced the podcast as well as myself. Uh, so if you still haven't listened to that, I suggest you do so. Uh, so you know what we're all about here, who I am, and why I'm just so excited to share all this information with you. Uh, near the end of the first episode, I mentioned that in my second episode, this one right here that you are listening to, we will be doing a little history lesson on the roles women played in the manga and anime industries. Uh, so welcome again, settle into a comfy space, and let's get started. So I looked into two articles to get our discussion started off today. I will be relaying information from the Women Make Anime article on BFI.org, written by Ren Skateni, uh, and from the the Role of Women in Japan's Anime Industry article on ScreenWaffle.com, written by Billy. Uh, if you'd like to read these articles for yourself, I will be providing links in the bio below, but if listening to a breakdown of the articles is enough for you, then I hope I can do... Uh, the information justice with my summaries. Um, majority of the anime knowledge that I picked up is from these two articles, uh, so definitely check it out. There is some information that I'm not including uh, in my podcast, so definitely check it out to discover some other creators. Um, I mentioned in my last episode that there was a recent survey conducted in November 2021 that showed 70% uh, of manga authors are women, and that's absolutely great for the manga industry, but what about the anime industry? It's been very difficult trying to look up female animators uh, working in the anim anime industry, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Uh, unfortunately, female animators are still kind of like on a small majority, uh, in terms of popular animators. Uh, again, they are still out there, but there aren't as many key animators that people can really pull off the top of their heads. Um, and a, a lot of these female animators, their work is being overshadowed by their male colleagues. So let's just dive in and see what that is. So animation in Japan started back in the early 1900s, and most of the short animated cartoons were used for war propaganda. And at this time, women weren't really expected to truly work. Uh, society expected them to just get married, have kids, and look after the house where their husbands uh, went out to work. And these societal expectations carried over into the anime industry, uh, since men were the only ones expected to find work. And it doesn't really surprise me so far, uh, since uh, it's pretty similar here in America. You know, back then, it wasn't until the wars that women began working in factories uh, when the men went off to fight. So I'm not really surprised to hear that Japanese women were also kind of focused on marriage and families rather than work, especially with, you know, cultural differences and uh, their beliefs and societal expectations. So again, since it's pretty similar to our um, times, I, I'm not really surprised. Um, but anyways, according to the Women Make Anime article, Japanese women were given the chance to take on animation in their free time. Uh, basically, while a woman was at her own home taking care of the kids, if the time allowed, she had the opportunity to do shiage work. And this is a term brought up in both of the articles that I read. Shiage work is what we have translated into finishing touches. Uh, shiage work included inking, coloring, and cleaning up the drawings uh, on the production frames that were given to them. So back in the day of manual animation before computers, when each frame of the animation was drawn by hand on paper, men did the initial drawings while women added in the colors, kind of cleaned up everything. So in the late 1900s, around the 70s and 80s, women were carrying the majority of the shiage roles or the finishing touches at different animation studios. According to the Role of Women in Japan's Anime Industry article, these roles were advertised to women's magazines that were targeted towards housewives, and these advertisements were promoted, uh, they promoted a chance at education and enrichment. Uh, which was, quote, recommended to be much more valuable 
than the time women would waste lazing around in between cooking, housework, and childcare, end quote. And I just found this wording to be so, like, funny. Um, it, it's really wild to imagine that, you know, back in these days, that's all women were really expected to do, and they, they didn't really have much else. It, it seems, from this quote specifically, and how the advertising, advertisements were, you know, promoting education and, you know, enrichment, it, it's just weird to, you know, imagine a time where women weren't working and this was kind of their only chance to have an outside experience other than, you know, domestic care, really. Um, so yeah, that was just really interesting to hear about that they truly advertise this for housewives. Uh, and the article goes on to explain that in the 1980s, uh, specifically, there was a lot of expectations for housewives and women were discouraged from working outside of domestic home duties. Um, all that was really available for women to work were part-time or temporary jobs. So the roles of Shiage continued to be relevant during this time since it was a part-time, uh, past-time kind of hobby. And because there were no full-time jobs, it was hard for women doing Shiage work to expand their careers. You know, there were men working in animation roles, and they were all progressing their careers, and they are the ones who ended up making a successful career, while women had their career growth kind of stunted. Uh, they couldn't expand on larger productions and larger jobs, so women got a really late start in the game. Uh, still, during the rise of anime, women were becoming animators and doing more than just inking, coloring, and cleanup. Uh, the Women Make Anime article mentions that when Studio Ghibli was founded in 1985, many capable female art animators were involved in these studio's projects. Uh, that's going to bring up our first featured animator, uh, Futaki Makiko. And again, I'm so sorry if I butcher any names within this podcast, I'm trying my best. Uh, so, Futaki recently passed away in 2016, but her work has never been forgotten. One of the first projects that she worked on was Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, which came out in 1984. I personally have seen this, and it was so beautiful. Um, and Futaki Makiko has also received praise for her work as a key animator for the film Akira, which came out in 1988, and this was actually a pretty major animated film. And, um... Uh, Again, these were coming out in the 80s, and this was the time that the last article mentioned women were only offered part-time or temporary works. So, you know, this is kind of a woman that was an example of someone who was able to get out of Shiage work. Uh, even if that's how she began, uh, she's now become a key animator, and her work was really being recognized and praised, which was just really cool. Uh, from the 80s and onward, more and more female animators were starting to grow in the industry, taking on key animator roles, and they began to branch out into other roles, from writing to directing, uh, which brings us to our current day. Um, and if you read the articles that I will provide links below, you will see some other writers, animators, and directors mentioned, so I really recommend if you want to go check them out. Um, but yeah, it all started with background roles as men took the lead. So they had that first leap and as time went on, uh, women began to start running and taking on their own leading roles in the anime industry. And I hope that in the future, uh, we'll have many more successful female animators and so on. And that just about sums up the women's role in anime. And now I just wanted to quickly cover where it began for women mangaka or uh, women manga authors and illustrators. So the first successful female manga artist was Machiko Hasegawa, and her successful series was called Sazai-san, and this came out in 1946. Uh, so she kind of kick-started manga for women written by women. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, the mangas written for girls were called shoujo manga, and this term is still used today. Uh, shoujo manga is still very prevalent. And these are comics that are written for young girls, and most of these are, they fall within the romance genre. And majority of mangaka for shoujo comics were female, which makes sense. Uh, turns out, during this time, there actually were men 
trying to write comics aimed towards girls and they really failed to draw in an audience and be successful due to their passive and uninteresting characters. And I'm really not surprised to hear this. Um, I personally have read a couple uh, quote shoujo manga written by men or I don't even think they're classified as shoujo. I think they are written for like a male demographic, but um, I have read things written by men that were supposed to be like a romance genre and I personally have not been a fan. Um, I totally am not surprised that, you know, earlier comics failed due to passive and uninteresting characters um, because they definitely, a lot of works that I have seen, um, a lot of their female characters kind of fall short. I feel like there are missing character developments. I feel like they're kind of stereotyped into certain uh, characters. And, you know, compared to some of the romance series that I've read written by women, uh, a lot of the characters were more interesting. They had some background. There was a lot of development and they kind of focused on the relationship. And I just think overall it was really well rounded. Um, so again, not really surprised that men tried to write things for girls and it did not go as well because they have the male gaze, whereas there is the feminine female gaze, and it's just a clash of those conflicts. Uh, in the 1980s, we began to see Jose manga, which are comics written for an older female audience. Uh, when the term was first created, Jose manga was still relatively innocent with the romance stories, but over the years, many comics began to feature sexual content. Um, so the two terms are still used today with shoujo and jose. Jose will still be manga written for older women, and because it is an older, older, more mature audience, a lot of the content will tend to follow a more mature, you know, style as well. Um, so I, yeah, those are the two types of manga. And while I discuss these two female targeted manga types, women haven't been restricted to write romance stories for women. Uh, it's not like all women creators have to write shoujo innocent little girl stories or jose women stories. Uh, in fact, a lot of women began writing shonen manga. And shonen is the term for comics written for a young male audience. Uh, while many of these stories written by women weren't as successful, compared to some of these shonen works by male writers, that doesn't mean there weren't any female successes. Uh, one of the first female... Oh, uh, sorry. One of the successful female mangaka who wrote comics for the male demographic was Hiromu Arakawa, who I mentioned in the first episode. Again, I will have to stop myself here since she will be getting her own episode soon. Uh, I know you must be curious by now because I've mentioned her twice, and trust me, I'm just as impatient to talk about her too, but I must hold off for now. Anyways, uh, with women writing manga stories for both male and female audiences, we can see how 70% of all mangaka are women. A major contributor to this is technology. I have seen that once tablets were created, uh, many women began digital drawing and uploading their own comics to the web. It was kind of just an easier platform for them to work with. Um, so that's how they would do it before making deals with publishing companies and being featured in magazines or having their own series physically printed on its own. Um, so just over the years, they started to, you know, take over, which is really cool to see. <laughs> um, but yeah, that just sums up everything that I wanted to cover on kind of where women started in the anime industry and kind of how uh, women in the manga industry began. Um, I hope this podcast has been educational for anyone listening. I definitely felt like I learned a few things while prepping for this episode, so I was really excited to share my new knowledge with my audience. I hope it came across really well. This is my first podcast, so I'm trying my best. <laughs> um, the odds of success, uh, the odds of becoming successful in the anime industry were so against female creators that it's just very inspirational to see them grow and become successful. I hope it provides relief to anyone who wanted to pursue animation or is currently writing their stories, whether it be manga or just writing in general. 
uh, women are starting to make their mark in the entertainment industry, and many women before us have opened this door of opportunity for us. You know, starting as background work and building up their own careers, and this is all their hard work is allowing women to have their own creative platform. So now's the time to take advantage of their hard work and put yourself out there and, you know, start making a name of yourself and, you know, in the future we'll be able to mention you in these kind of podcasts, you know, show all the hard work that you did in building these industries. Uh, so thank you for listening to episode two of Women Behind Anime and Manga. A <laughs> um, In episode three, we will be focusing on the musician and composer Yoko Kano and some of her famous works. We'll be learning about her and even listening to clips of her music. So I'm very excited to um, host this episode and listen to some of her work. I have been a fan, and if you are an anime fan, you probably know her. There's no way that you don't. Um, so I'm really excited to jump in with a music with a musician, and I just really hope to see you all there. So until next time, this is Valerie signing off.